right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Just a few things to cover, and then I'll get right to your questions. Uh, as you're aware, North Korea conducted another ballistic missile launch last night, launching two short-range missiles. The United States strongly condemns this irresponsible act, which violates numerous unanimous United Nations Security Council mandates. The DPRK is urged to immediately cease actions that violate UN Security Council resolutions, escalate military tensions, destabilize the region, and endanger the peace and security of innocent people. In response to the DPRK's provocative ballistic missile launch, the USS Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group, joined by two Japanese Navy destroyers and one Republic of Korea Navy destroyer, arrived October 5th in the Sea of Japan to conduct trilateral ballistic missile defense exercises. These exercises send a clear message of allied unity between our nations and enhance the interoperability of our collective forces. The exercises also demonstrate the deep strength of our trilateral relationship with Japan and the Republic of Korea, which is resolute against those who challenge regional stability. Moving forward, we will continue to consult closely with our allies and partners and stand ready to respond appropriately to any potential future provocative acts by North Korea. As always, we remain committed to preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific and peace and stability throughout the region. Separately, after 18 months of thorough work, to include consultations with subject matter experts, historians, and communities rooted in the bases in question, the Naming Commission completed its analysis and provided Secretary Austin with its final report. After reviewing the report, the Secretary has concurred with all of the Naming Commission's recommendations and is committed to implementing them as soon as possible. Today, Secretary Austin has directed DOD leaders and the services via a memo to begin implementation immediately following the NDAA-mandated 90-day waiting period. A copy of the memo will be available on defense.gov. Secretary Austin is grateful for the work of the Commission and thanks them for their dedicated efforts and recommendations that will give proud new names that are rooted in their local communities and that honor American heroes whose valor, courage, and patriotism exemplify the very best of the U.S. military. Also, the White House announced today new actions by more than 20 agencies to include the Department of Defense designed to bolster the federal government's resilience to climate change impacts. As you may recall, last year the DOD released its Climate Adaption Plan on October 7, 2021. Today, we're releasing a progress report highlighting DOD's investments toward increasing our resilience and efforts to improve combat capability while also reducing the department's climate impacts. The full DOD report is available on defense.gov. Finally, on a special note, we'd like to recognize and congratulate U.S. Marine Corps Colonel Nicole Mann, who yesterday became the first female Marine and Native American to lead a NASA space flight. Colonel Mann and SpaceX Crew-5 successfully launched into space from Kennedy Space Center, bound for the International Space Station, with Colonel Mann serving as the mission commander. Semper Fi and Bravo Zulu, Colonel Mann. Uh, we wish her and the crew the best for a successful mission. And with that, I will take your questions. We'll go to Lita first. Yes, ma'am. Um, thanks, Pat. Um, the North Koreans have also flown fighter jets and bombers near the border. Um, which prompted another response from South Korea. Um, today, they flew, I guess, another 30 um, aircraft in response. Um, what does the department think of this sort of ratcheting up of tensions in the area? Does this suggest um, tensions are higher than they have been in quite some time? Does this sort of suggest that there could be an ICBM test or some sort of nuclear test from North Korea coming. What is the U.S. assessment of these actions? Well, sure. Uh, I mean, overall, uh, as, as I've mentioned, uh, we consider this behavior uh, destabilizing, uh, unhelpful, and irresponsible. Uh, and again, we call on the DPRK to, to cease these types of actions. Um, as I mentioned in, in my opening remarks, our focus continues to be on consulting closely with our allies in the region to include South Korea and Japan on how to best and most appropriately respond uh, to this, these types of actions. And so in the days ahead, we'll continue to do that. Well, do you, uh, does the U.S. see moving the ships into that region as further um, provoking North Korea to do something more? Uh, well, really, I don't want to speak for North Korea in terms of what may or may not be causing them to respond this way. I, I am aware of their uh, public statements on the matter. Uh, regardless, our focus in the region, the, these are 
uh, actions that we announce uh, in advance. They're actions that we uh, have implemented as part of a defense uh, in support of our, our allies in the region. Uh, and so, again, we'll continue to, to focus on those areas uh, and would hope that North Korea would also have the best interests of the region and peace and stability as well. Thank you. Since I know this is on your mind, you want to ask about Ukraine today, right? Okay. Thank you. I forgot, forgot North Korea again now. North Korea fired two different kind of missiles at a new locations. And North Korea uh, is firing uh, missiles at different places at different times. How do you see this? Sure. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I know we've said it from here and, and others uh, within the U.S. government uh, that clearly uh, North Korea is testing its missile program. Uh, it's looking to adapt uh, and uh, the issue here, though, is that these actions are provocative, uh, they're dangerous, and uh, as you well know, North Korea has not committed to any type of constructive or strategic dialogue on these issues. Uh, and so, in so much as they're testing these missiles uh, and the way that they're doing it, it has the great potential for um, destabilizing the region. So again, we're going to continue to work closely with our allies uh, to demonstrate our commitment to the defense. Uh, of one another's uh, interests and nations. Uh, and so in the days ahead, we'll continue to consult closely in the event of potential future tests or other actions. I would hope that doesn't occur, um, but if it does, we'll be prepared. Do you think uh, it is time for the military actions against North Korea? Is the United States prepared for that? No, I think that we're gonna continue to work closely with Japan and with South Korea uh, again, our focus is on preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific, an Indo-Pacific that's peaceful and stable, and again, would call on North Korea uh, to look to work towards those same interests. Lara. Let me go ahead and move on here. Lara, Thank and then you. I'm going to uh, go to the questions. phone. Um, first of all, to follow up on North Korea, can you talk a little bit about the ballistic missile defense exercises that the Ronald Reagan strike group uh, participated in? What do these involve exactly? Are they shooting interceptors or are they doing other types of activities? Uh, yeah. So what I can provide you is just a little insight into the ships that are participating. I'd refer you to uh, Indopaycom. They can provide you uh, with some additional details on the specifics. But uh, we've got the USS Chancellorville. Uh, from the strike group, which is a guided missile cruiser, uh, and then the USS Benfold, uh, which is a guided missile destroyer uh, that also is a part of the carrier strike group. Uh, they're conducting these exercises in the Sea of Japan uh, alongside uh, a Japanese maritime self-defense force destroyer uh, and a Republic, uh, two destroyers actually, and a Republic of Korea Navy destroyer. Uh, and so, again, I'd, I'd refer you to them for the specifics in terms of the, the operational level details of the exercise. And to follow up on that, some experts have, have noted that um, North Korea fired the missiles on Tuesday after the U.S. and South Korea began these um, joint military exercises that we hadn't done in five years. What, what, would, you, what would your response be to that, that, that claim that, you know, we started it? Um, well, clearly, again, uh, us participating in exercises in the region or um, engaging in bilateral or trilateral exercises is not something new. Uh, we have a long-standing defense relationships uh, relationship with both China, uh, with both uh, South Korea and with Japan, and um, these are defensive exercises that are focused on how we would defend ourselves and how we would deter. Um, and they are not a threat at all to the region, unlike the provocative activities coming from North Korea. So let me go ahead and move on. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Another question on the, the aircraft in the north and south. Um, I believe the uh, South Koreans said that the northern uh, fighters and bombers crossed the special reconnaissance line. I was wondering if you could give a sense of how close those uh, North Korean aircraft actually got to the border. Um, and secondly, is there any precedent for this? I'm not aware of um, the South scrambling jets in response to northern aircraft coming close to the border. Um, and if this is a new phenomenon, is, that, is this a new avenue of destabilization? Is that something you're concerned about? Yes, yeah, so at a, at a macro level, I'm not aware of any specific, uh, for example, unsafe or unpref 
professional behavior by North Korean pilots uh, in terms of where they went to in terms of the, the border. I have to refer you to South Korea. Similarly, uh, any, anything regarding South Korean Air Forces, they'd be in the best position to answer your question. Thank you. Let me go out to the phone here real quick. Uh, Steve uh, Benyon from military.com. I appreciate it. Uh, has there been any uh, further discussions or plans uh, when it comes to training Ukrainians on uh, American soil with using any schools, uh, Ranger School or any NCO professional development schools or anything along those lines? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I don't have anything specific uh, to provide today in terms of Ukrainians on U.S. soil. You know, certainly uh, we we have a longstanding uh, security relationship with Ukraine uh, and have had Ukrainians in the past uh, serving in, in various locations in the U.S. Uh, for example, um, from my own experience during my time at U.S. Central Command, for example, we had uh, Ukrainian <coughs> forces there. Uh, but I don't have anything specific to provide in terms of training on U.S. soil. Uh, I will say in the, in the days and weeks ahead, uh, as we continue to work with our international partners and our allies on support to Ukraine, uh, as, as was discussed at the last contact group, um, at Ramstein, training is a significant aspect of that. Most of that training is being conducted uh, in the European uh, area of responsibility. Um, but uh, if and when we have anything to announce regarding training on U.S. soil, we'll be sure to let you do that. Thank you. Let me go one more on the phone here and we'll come back to the group. Uh, J.J. Green, WTOP. General, thank you for the opportunity. Um, instability on the battlefield has been pretty consistent in this war in Ukraine that Russia is waging, but we're starting to see a lot more inconsistency and pressure on the administration, the Putin administration in Moscow. And I'm just curious if, if this is of concern to the U.S. military because of Russia's threats and because of some of the actions that Russia has taken in terms of the Zaporizhia plant, and those threats I'm referring to are threats of using possibly tactical nuclear weapons. Okay, if I if I can apologize, break down your question. So I, what I think you're asking is concerns about instability in the Russian government, uh, and then concerns about nuclear threats. Was that your question, JJ? That's it. So in regards to the the Russian government, uh, I, I'm not going to comment on that. That's clearly something uh, that's in the purview of the, the Russian people. Our focus is on supporting Ukraine uh, as they defend their, their country. Uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the nuclear threats, um, you know, we've talked about this. Um, many people in our government uh, and in the international community, to include Secretary Austin, have, have highlighted the fact that this nuclear saber rattling is uh, reckless and irresponsible. Um, as I've mentioned before, at this stage, uh, we do not have uh, any information that would cause us to change our strategic deterrence posture, uh, and, and we don't assess that uh, President Putin has made a decision to use nuclear weapons uh, at this time. Again, we're taking it very seriously. We'll continue to monitor. Um, uh, but in the meantime, again, our focus is on supporting Ukraine. Okay, let me come back to the room. Tony? Back to the, uh, the vessels in the, uh, the uh, east of Korea, South Korea. Are you implying, are you saying that they, they're all equipped with Aegis ballistic missile defense capability, the Chancellorville and the, I think the Bainbridge, you said? Or uh, we've got the Chancellorville, Chancellorsville, and the Benfold. Are they equipped with Aegis ballistic missile defense? Equi uh, I'd have to refer you to the, the Navy on that. Because if the Navy blows us off, can you direct them to answer that question? <laughs> no, seriously. Because yeah. there's a limited number of those vessels on the seventh floor. We'll, we'll take the question, Tony, and uh, we'll get you what we can provide. Uh, the USS Chancellorville, you talked about earlier the commission to rename bases. Did they recommend that the USS Chancellorville be named, uh, renamed? Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the report, Tony. I don't have that in front of me. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, Kasim. General, is there a discussion at the Pentagon on a potential revision of uh, relations with Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates after the OPEC Plus decision to slash oil production by 2 million barrels a day? Um, so I don't have anything to provide from a DOD perspective. Um, obviously, uh, the, uh, the White House has put out a statement on that, uh, but I'd refer you to the, the White House. And many congressmen, uh, members of Congress, has put out statements tweets that the United States should revise its relations with 
uh, Saudi Arabia and also uh, stop uh, providing arms, arms sales to Saudi Arabia. What is the Pentagon position on this? Yeah, so I'm not going to comment on uh, any congressional statements. Um, you know, again, our focus is on conducting our mission uh, wherever that may be, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Sir, and then I'll come to you. Sir, inside Defense. Um, to, to OPEC, uh, it looks like DOD has reprogrammed about $2 billion since July to address uh, unbudgeted fuel costs, and now OPEC has said they're going to start cutting the global supply of oil. How is that going to impact how the department pays for fuel, as it already seems to be a challenge because the cost has already been going up? Yeah, so I'm not going to speak to OPEC uh, in, in uh, you know, specifically. Obviously, the Defense Logistics Agency uh, does a great job every day of determining what the department's fuel and energy requirements are. Uh, they will take into account a whole variety of issues and factors and variables to ensure that our forces have the fuel and the energy they need, regardless of where they're serving. So thanks very much. Fadi. Thank you, General. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one, we've seen a number of statements coming out of Israel uh, indicating a potential escalation with Lebanon. Uh, Minister of Defense, uh, Benny Gantz, uh, talked about this and even called on his uh, forces to be ready for potential escalation, warned Hezbollah. Media reports about the Security Council, Israeli Security Council, talking about preparation for potential escalation. Is the Pentagon monitoring the situation between Israel and Lebanon? Uh, have you seen any indication of possibility of escalation between these two countries and are you in touch with your counterparts both on Lebanon and Israel and I have a separate question Thank sure you. Um, so you know in, in terms of the um, the the broader Middle East um, we're, we're always keeping an eye on things um, we clearly uh, have many partners uh, in, in the region and communicate with them on a regular basis uh, to include having uh, representatives of the Department of Defense uh, working in Israel uh, and in Lebanon, obviously through our, you know, defense attaches uh, and, and other security cooperation. Uh, in regards to the current situation, I don't have any specifics to provide uh, or, um, you know, again, we'll continue to monitor the situation. And, and on the raid uh, today in northeast Syria, uh, our understanding is it happened near Kamishli. Uh, an ISIS leader uh, goes by the name Rakan Wahid al Shamari uh, was killed. Um, are you able to say whether uh, the operation happened in an area that's controlled by the Syrian regime military or forces loyal to the Syrian regime? Um, so I can tell you that it happened near the village of uh, Kamishli, uh, which is, as you know, northeast Syria. Um, CENTCOM is putting out a statement on this. If you, if you don't have it already, uh, you yeah, should we, have it. We did, but it, it doesn't go into that part, so I was wondering if you can, uh, if you have additional details. I don't have any additional details to provide. Thanks very much. Let me go to Rio, and then I'll go back out to the phone. Thank you, General, for taking my question. Uh, on North Korea, uh, could you give us an update on the North Korea's preparation over a nuclear test? Does the Pentagon assess North Korea is ready to conduct a nuclear test at any moment? Um, thanks, Rio. So I, you know, talked about this a little bit on Tuesday. I don't have any updates to provide from what I provided to you previously, other than, again, uh, we do assess uh, that, that North Korea has been making preparations if and when they do conduct a nuclear test. Um, I'm not going to speculate. So thanks. All right, let me go out to the phone here. Heather uh, from USNI. Thank you so much. Um, besides the two ships that you mentioned as part of the Ronald Reagan, is there any plans to send any more ships over there to conduct exercises to make a statement? So thanks, Heather. I, I'm not tracking uh, anything in particular. I, you know, I'm not going to talk about future operations, uh, but uh, as of right now, um, I, I don't have anything beyond what I've already provided to you. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, before my South Asia question, if I may go to North Korea, who is helping North Korea, China or Russia, or is it, is it uh, something to do with the Ukraine war there? Um, that is a very broad, open-ended question. Um, and if you're, if the question that you're asking is, uh, uh, is China or Russia assisting North Korea with their missile program, um, I'm, I'm not really going to get into intelligence, what we may or may not know in that regard. Clearly. Uh, North Korea maintains a relationship with China uh, and with Russia, 
uh, which says a lot. Uh, and so I'm going to just leave it at that. Thanks and, very much. Uh, and then your South Asia question. South Asia, yes, sir. I mean, on India, how seriously Secretary of Defense or this building takes the remarks by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on or with President Putin that almost eight months old war will be over. This is one of the longest wars in history between a superpower and a tiny nation. So almost eight months. So uh, Prime Minister Modi said that war will be over or he told the President Putin. I'm not sure I understand. What, what's the question? During Prime Minister Narendra Modi's meeting with President Putin, he told President Putin that war should be over. And how seriously you think you, this building or secretary takes the remarks by Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to comment specifically on the prime minister's comments. Um, what I will say uh, is that, as evidenced uh, recently by some of those discussions and, and what we saw in the, in the public in terms of the response by international leaders, uh, to include in China, uh, to President Putin, uh, is very indicative of the fact that um, Russia stands alone in this issue uh, and its aggression of Ukraine. And finally, how do you put the relation between military to military relation between the United States and India today? Uh, I think we have good relations. And I think, uh, as evidenced by Secretary Austin's, uh, Secretary Austin's engagements most recently uh, with both the foreign minister and with the uh, minister of defense, uh, it's a relationship that we look forward to continuing to improve, uh, and particularly focused on the interoperability between our two militaries. So um, I think it's moving in the, in the right direction. OK, let me go ahead and ask a few other questions. Yes, Liz. Um, back to the ISIS raid in northeast Syria, it's been years and years since the U.S. has conducted a raid in that part of the country. Um, can you speak to why now and the significance of that? Um, so I don't, I don't know that I can speak to specifically why this location other than the fact that uh, clearly there was an ISIS uh, terrorist uh, and uh, CENTCOM deemed it necessary as part of our continuing defeat ISIS campaign to strike there. I, I don't know that my point being uh, location agnostic, right? We're going to go where we need to go uh, if there's a threat that presents itself. Uh, and again, I would encourage you to contact CENTCOM and they can give you a, a much uh, higher level of detail. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, the SDF has conducted a series of raids um, in El Hall camp <coughs> recently. Um, and they're, you know, U.S. backed forces. Is ISIS a growing threat in that camp? Um, well, I mean, you've seen, uh, you've seen, as, as I have, a lot of reporting on the challenges with uh, some of these large uh, camps where um, you have ISIS uh, and these indoct the indoctrination of future ISIS, um, you know, potential future, future ISIS recruits. So um, I know that this is something that's being taken very seriously, uh, not only by the SDF, um, but also by the U.S. Uh, and as we work in, as part of the Defeat ISIS campaign. Um, so, you know, in a lot of ways, ISIS, uh, clearly ISIS is not the threat that they were uh, back in 2014. Uh, and the point is we want to keep it that way. And so it's something that we have to just continue to work very hard on, uh, which is, again, uh, a large reason why you saw an operation like you did last night. Thank you. Let me go back up to the phone, then I'll come back in the room here. Uh, Songman Lee from Radio Free Asia. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Uh, let me ask again uh, North Korea. So you mentioned that you, you're trying to close consultation with uh, Japan and South Korea about uh, uh, responding measure to North Korea uh, provocations. So can you tell me specifically what measure are you considering to respond to North Korea provocations? I'm sorry, I'm having a real time song I'm hearing what hearing what you're saying. Can you ask that again? Yeah, can you tell me any specific measure uh, to respond to North Korea provocation you are considering? Any specific measures? Uh, so, you know, again, I don't want to talk about potential future operations. Uh, as I mentioned, our focus is on working with our allies and our partners in the region to preserve peace and stability, uh, to demonstrate uh, that we are um, going to work together to deter uh, potential future actions, um, 
if and when there are uh, future provocations, you know, we'll, we'll take the appropriate action. Our role is to provide, and the DOD is to provide our leadership with options, um, but I'm not going to speculate about what those may or may not be. Okay, let, let me go to Phil Stewart, Reuters. Well, hey there. Um, so, uh, real quick, uh, on the issue of the Saudis, um, has the Secretary been contacted by members of Congress who, you know, Representative Malinowski is calling for the withdrawal of U.S. forces in the wake of these uh, this decision by OPEC Plus. Um, has he is he being in contact with Saudi officials about his concerns uh, potentially to uh, U.S. military support and the U.S. military relationship there? Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Um, in in regards to uh, communication with Congress, uh, the secretary communicates with members of Congress on a wide variety of issues. I don't I don't have any specifics uh, to provide. Um, he did conduct a uh, phone call, uh, as you know, with his Saudi counterpart um, recently, and we issued a readout on that. So uh, you should have that available on our on our website there. We can get it to you, uh, which details the the nature of that conversation. Thank you. Uh, let me let me get some other folks here. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. Uh, General, regarding to El Yemen, uh, the parties um, they failed to extend the ceasefire agreement. So. Uh, how worried are you about any escalation could be happened in the next coming days? And my second question is, are you preparing for any future transfer defense weapon to Saudi Arabia and Emirates? Um, so on your latter question, I don't have anything to announce today. Uh, in terms of Yemen, clearly uh, it's in everyone's interest for there not to be escalation. Uh, as evidenced by uh, what we highlighted in that readout. Uh, and so, again, we would hope uh, that um, parties could continue to work together to try to de-escalate and resolve this situation more peacefully. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, back to Syria. I understand you don't have details on the location of the raid, but broadly speaking, can you tell us if whether the uh, U.S. forces in Syria can conduct operations or raids in areas under the regime, the Syrian regime control, without uh, any sort of coordination with the regime forces? Um, so th the short answer is we will conduct operations where we need to uh, if there is a threat against uh, U.S. personnel, our allies, our partners, or our interests. And so um, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, the adoption of uh, sanctions against North Korea failed due to uh, China and Russia's veto at the UN Security Council resolution meeting yesterday, and also China blaming about the U.S. and ROK joint military exercises. How can you comment on this? I'm going to apologize. I'm not sure I understand. How do I comment on China and North Korea's um, condemnation of the U.S.? China, so China and Russia vetoes at the U.N. Security Council for uh, sanctions against yeah, the Russia. I, I would say, again, our, our focus, uh, the United States working with our allies and our partners in the region, our focus is on, uh, and we've said this many times, trying to preserve a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think many like-minded nations in the region agree. Uh, and that it's all it's in all of our best interests to have a region that's peaceful and that's stable uh, and that actions that uh, detract from that or that are provocative are not helpful. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, let me go back up to the phone here. Uh, Jeff Selden, VOA. Thanks very much for doing this. Uh, quick question uh, following up on, on ISIS in Syria. I know you don't have details of the actual raid itself, but taking a step back, uh, can you describe or talk about generally the threat that ISIS poses, especially from regime-held areas of Syria, it, it's something that's been voiced multiple times over the years as concerns by U.S. officials, military officials. Is is the threat from ISIS in regime-controlled Syria growing, changing? What, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So again, I would I would refer you to CENTCOM for a detailed. Uh, uh, explanation in terms of the current status of, of ISIS and, and where they are in Syria specifically. Again, uh, ISIS in Syria is not a new thing. Uh, they were largely neutralized, of course, uh, as, you know, uh, part of the, the counter-ISIS campaign. But that, that campaign still continues because the threat 
uh, still exists, although to a much smaller degree. And so our focus is to continue to uh, work with our uh, partners in the region uh, by, with, and through uh, to uh, eliminate that threat and hopefully uh, prevent it from uh, spreading further. Thanks. All right, let me go to Lara, and then I'll do a couple more in here. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you, um, with the defense contact group coming up next week, can you say a little bit about where the discussion stands in, in terms of sending tanks to Ukraine, modern tanks, not just the old Soviet tanks? I, I understand there's complications with sending the, the Abrams, but perhaps um, there's a German tank that there might be discussions around sending instead. Can you just give us an update? Yeah. So. Uh, I don't have any specifics today to provide clearly, uh, and, and we'll put out a, a press release on this uh, announcing it, but next week uh, we will conduct a, UK, a Ukraine defense contact group session uh, on the margins of the NATO defense ministerials uh, in Brussels. Uh, we look forward to engaging with our allies and our partners to discuss support to Ukraine. I know there will be a variety of topics discussed. Uh, to include uh, security assistance. And so um, after that, we may have more to provide. So thank you. All right, let me go. Uh, yes, sir. I had a question about cybersecurity. Uh, there are reports that uh, pro-Russia hacking group Killnet compromised a U.S. defense data center uh, and also websites run by governments in states like Colorado and Connecticut. Uh, does the Pentagon have any assessment of what happened there? Uh, is there a statement you could provide? Yeah, I don't have anything on that, but we'll, I'll take that question and we'll get back to you. Kasa, I'm going to go to you and I'm going to go to the phone. Yes, sir. Two clarification questions. One, you said you mentioned the phone call between SecDef and his Saudi counterpart. It was before, of course, the OPEC uh, plus institution. Did he hand up to Secretary of Defense, like saying, hey, we are going to do this? Hey, uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys. I'm not going to have anything to provide beyond what we've uh, provided in the readout. But thank you. Mm -hmm. The, the SANTCOM statement, and you also mentioned village of Kamishli. Is yes, this, sir. Is this, like we know that the city of Kamishli, is this something separate from that city? Uh, I would contact SANTCOM. They can give you the more specifics. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to Caitlin, New York Post. Hi there. Um, yesterday, the DOD released the names of Chinese military companies working in the U.S., um, does the DOD have business dealings with any of these companies? And if a contractor discloses they work with these companies, is the department less likely to accept that bid? Sorry, Caitlin, I'm having a hard time hearing, hearing you. Can you repeat that? Sure thing. Um, so yesterday, DOD released the names of the Chinese military companies working in the U.S., does the DOD have business dealings with any of these companies? And if a contractor says that they do work with these companies, um, is the Pentagon less likely to accept that bid? Thanks for the, the question. Um, Caitlin, we will, uh, I'll take that question and we'll come back to you on it. Thank you. All right, let me go to uh, Karun from Washington Post. Okay. Anyone else in the room here? Yes, ma'am, you get the last question. Um, on Taiwan, uh, do you have a sense that there is adequate uh, support for, from the U.S. for Taiwan's defense in the near and short term, short term and midterm, both in defensive capabilities as well as in planning and strategy, uh, given the sort of innovative changes that are happening in technology in the area? Well, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a lot uh, about our relationship with Taiwan um, and our responsibilities under the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, I don't have anything specific to provide to you today, but, uh, yeah, leave it at that. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.